paying attention. <laughs> <laughs> happy. Oh. It means happy. <laughs> okay. Lewis. In 1920. Good morning, church. <laughs> How's everybody this morning? Okay. Awesome. We had, well, it's starting to dry up already. It's going to be a warm day. We did get a little bit of rain. It was not raining on the other side of the town. That's what the hell was all. saying. It, <laughs> it, it, it was a it mist. It wasn't raining until you hit the bridge here at Marion. <laughs> <laughs> Got to have that definitive line there. There you go. Well, for those of you that are watching with us online, please let us uh, know you're here. Say good morning in the comments. Uh, we'd like to see who all is present with us and worshiping with us on each Sunday morning. Not a lot of announcements this morning. You know, we get we get going, we get going really fast, then we slow down a little bit and take a little pause. Mm -hmm. But we do have some things that are coming up on Wednesday night. We're going to be continuing watching uh, the Bible story. And uh, this epic mini-series is so far has been amazing. I think everybody can agree that's been watching it with us that the graphics and on it are one thing, but the fact that it's bringing the story up and off the pages is something completely different. And just seeing that is pretty neat in a different way than we've seen it before. Then following that on Saturday, and if you can't tell what that is, it's not just men's breakfast. That is a sunny side of egg and bacon. <laughs> and and so there there was some there was some you know biscuits and gravy absolutely that's that's just kind of a staple but there's rumor of maybe some corned beef hash so you know we tried to we tried to uh, mix it up a little bit but join us on Saturday the third at nine a.m. for a time of fellowship with other men and just getting stronger and then also a time of devotion uh, always a great discussion with that. The following week, we'll be kicking off our August uh, Orange Track Racing uh, Races. That just sounds weird, Racing Races. But that's what it is. And uh, registration's at 9.30, racing at 10. I, I told everybody at the movie last night, I said, yeah, we can't wait for the season to end and get some puzzled looks. And it wasn't because we, don't, we want the season to end quickly. It's because we want to get to work over the winter break at getting... Uh, the new track that we have laid uh, so that we can race new track for our 20th season next year. So uh, kind of a neat way to kick off our next decade of racing. Um, if you're watching online, the link to the worship music is going to be put in there for you uh, so that you can worship <coughs> with the same music that we'll be worshiping uh, worshiping with here as always this music is curated with a very specific purpose and it ties right back into the message so let's go to God in prayer Heavenly Father we thank you for this day each and every day that you give us Father is a blessing each and every day that you give us is another chance for us to be your light in this ever darkening world Every day that you give us, our relationship with you grows stronger. Thank you, Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. <clears> that <throat> uh, last part was kind of important because that's going to be a big <coughs> part of the message today because Pastor Mark is going to be taking us on a journey. We've been on a journey in the last few weeks. He's going to take us on a journey from religion to relationship. So as you hear... The call to worship from Mark 6. Listen to the words and try to see it maybe from a different point of view as you listen to these words. Immediately he made his disciples get into the boat and go before him to the other side to Bethsaida while he sent the multitude away. And when he had sent them away, he departed to the mountain to pray. Now when evening came, the boat was in the middle of the sea, and he was alone on the land. Then he saw them straining at rowing, for the wind was against them. Now about the fourth watch of the night, he came to them, walking on the sea, and would have passed them by. And when they saw him walking on the sea, they supposed it was a ghost, and cried out, for they all saw him and were troubled. But immediately he talked with them and said to them, 
Be of good cheer. It is I. Do not be afraid. Then he went up into the boat to them, and the wind ceased. And they were greatly amazed in themselves beyond measure and marveled. For they had not understood about the loaves because their heart was hardened. Now this is after he had just fed the multitude. And he had sent them off saying he was going to stick back and he was going to pray. Now as you heard that, I hope you were thinking about relationship. Because while this scripture doesn't tell us about what Jesus prayed about, we know from other scripture that Jesus intercedes on our behalf. And Jesus is God. So I have to wonder at what his words were. But I can almost guess as to what they were. He knew the windstorm was coming. He knew what they were going to run into. And because he intercedes for us, how much you want to bet his prayer was interceding for them in the windstorm? Jesus continues to do it now for us. It's not a big stretch to think that he did it then. And as he saw them straining to row in that windstorm, I think God sees us when we strain in our storms. He sees us when we are struggling. And yeah, it might feel like he's not there sometimes. But guess what? He is. He's that footprints poem. When they get to the single set, he's carrying us. He's there. He's got a purpose. He's got a reason for why he allows us to go through our tests. He could have fixed our whatever it is in our storm just like that. Just as Jesus could have had calmed the seas. But instead, what did he do? He walked out to them. <coughs> he saw them. God sees us. They didn't recognize him. Why? Same reason we don't see God in things. Because we aren't looking for him. Your relationship to a street. So as we get ready to hear the message that God has placed on Mark's heart, my challenge is to you, are you upholding your part of the relationship? Father, we pray a special anointing upon Pastor Mark this morning as he comes up here to give your message. A message about how it's not a religion, it's a relationship. Father, I personally believe that I can't have a relationship with anyone else unless my relationship with you is solid. Father, open our hearts, open our ears, open our minds. And as we learn, let us take that message, let us take that learning and go out into the world after the service today and use it. In Jesus' mighty name. Amen. <clears throat> the temptation trace strikes again. <laughs> it's something about those brownie bites. I swear you can hear them calling your name. Yes. <laughs> I have a little problems with this time, so maybe we'll just go this route. Shut that guy off. So hopefully you'll be able to hear me. I'm loud. What can I say? Good morning, church. And if you're online, good morning as well. We're glad you're here with us. We had a great movie last night. Um, boy, if that didn't tug at your heartstrings a little bit, I don't know what will. So, uh, but it was, it was a story of loss. It was a story of being lost. 
and it was also a story of redemption. And really and truly, that's the story of each one of our lives as well, if we think about it. So, before we get too far in, this is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. But see, each of us, as we go through our lives each and every day, we have a, we have a reason to rejoice. We have a reason to look at the day and say, this is a new day, this is a new start, it's a fresh start. I don't have to be who I was yesterday. We might still be in the same circumstance as we were before, but as I said last night at the movie, don't let the circumstances define who you are. Don't allow those things that are exterior to your life become what your life is about. And that's very, very important. So I want you to hang on to that. I always have you hang on to at least you know two or three things during the message. But that's one of the things I want you to hang on to is the fact that we don't have to be defined on, by the circumstances or the environment in which we live. Sometimes we just kind of succumb to that. And that becomes what we might call a storm in our life, a challenge that we're facing in our life. Well, each of us has endured at least one storm in our lifetime. Just one? Some of us have weathered many, many storms. What makes the difference in the effect of the storm is how we view the storm. Early on in my life, I faced a pretty big storm. And being young and uninformed, that's a better way of saying stupid, uh, being young and uninformed, I tried to face that storm alone, on my own. Well, you can probably imagine how that turned out, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, not so well. Uh, but I'm sure if you think back to an earlier time in your lives as well, you probably could be part of this story as well. Because I think we've all done that. What makes the difference between now and back then is how we view the storm. And what makes the difference with that is, in my life as well, is having a living relationship with Jesus and having that relationship then change the way I view the storms that I face in life. Early on, I thought I just had to face the storm head on, fight my way through it. And I look back at then as it was almost insurmountable at times and frightening and stressful and intimidating, and we can go on and on and on. And I'm sure if you face that kind of storm early on, you could probably say the exact same thing. So as I grew in my faith, really, and I'm still growing as each one of ours, it is a lifelong learning process. I look for opportunities in the storm instead of the barriers that the storm presents. So looking for an opportunity in that storm changes the way we view that storm. Instead of being a barrier to our life at that point in time, we have an opportunity to learn and to change. That's really important because if we view the storm differently in our minds, that storm kind of dissipates a bit and it doesn't seem insurmountable, frightening, intimidating. It's how we view that storm and who is in the storm with us. If we have a relationship, a living relationship with Christ, he's by our side. He's going to bring us through the storm. We still have to face the storm, but we can view it differently. Then I pray about the situation that I'm facing and I invite God to be a part of it. You see, one of the biggest hurdles for us to overcome is not shutting God out of the process and doing it on our own understanding. We need to step aside and bring God in to calm the storm just as he did in the call to worship. If you notice, he got in the boat and the wind ceased. The storm dissipated because Christ was in the midst with us in that boat. Last night, I, I, I read something that I wrote yesterday afternoon before the movie 
Um, so I was sitting there and I was, I was kind of going through the sermon and everything and trying to make sure I, it was going to say what I wanted it to say. And Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 came in and it says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways submit to him and he will make your paths straight. See, if we stand on our own understanding in everything we do, and especially when we're facing those storms that we have in life, then we won't give God the opportunity to come in and work within that storm to do something very incredible with us. Notice I didn't say for us. I said with us. See, a lot of times we go to God and, and we say, hey, God, I've got this list. It's a Christmas list, kind of Santa Claus type thing. I want you to do this for me. I want this from you. But if we instead invite God into the process, we invite God into the storm, we invite God in, then we allow him to do something incredible with us, not for us. It's how you view the storm. You look for the opportunities. You see, Jesus faced storms in his life as well. And yet in the middle, middle of each, what did he do? He stopped and he prayed for God that he would be able to do his will, not his own. Before, you know, Jesus prayed over the food, the baskets, and the fish and the loaves, and he fed 5,000 and he still had baskets of food left over. Then what did he do? He sent the disciples away, he dispersed the crowds, and then he went to pray and have time alone with God. He was inviting God in, thanking him for handling the storm of trying to feed 5,000 people. How many loaves and fishes? <clears throat> I'll give you a hint, it's five and three, right? Mm -hmm. Okay. Fed that 5,000 people with food left over. So then what did he do? He went to have time with God to thank him for doing his will and something totally amazing. See, it wasn't that he didn't have to face the storm. And not a lot of times it's what we say, God, don't let me face this storm. But see, then we miss the opportunities. We miss the blessing that God could put upon it and something that he could do that was utterly amazing in the midst of the storm. We miss those opportunities to have God work in our lives in the midst of a storm. So he didn't ask for, when Jesus went to pray, he didn't ask for his own will to be done. He asked for God for his perfect will then to be done. And this may seem somewhat confusing if we're thinking in the vein of, of triune God, Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Was well, he asking himself for this? Or what is he doing? It's kind of the beauty of it all, really, if you think about it. Jesus was fully human, yet fully God. In his book, Simply Jesus, author and Bible scholar N.T. Wright describes a storm gathered off the Atlantic coast of the United States. And I don't know if you guys have ever heard of a nor'easter when they blow in on the Atlantic Ocean out there because the Atlantic is so cold and when they get warm winds coming in and in the midst of it, they usually hit in November, but it actually starts usually in the Great Lakes, Lake Superior, Lake Michigan. And they have nor'easters there that will swamp huge, huge ships in there. I know how those blow up because when I lived in Chicago, I, was, I went down, I only lived like a block and a half away from the lake when I first moved up there. And so we used to go down there and, and you know, I used to take my books and everything down there with me, and I would sit on the rocks. They had these huge rocks down there. And so I'd go down there and, and study. And I'd take my books and stuff, and they're, well, you know, when you're working and you're going to college full time and you fall asleep on the rocks because it was so nice and peaceful, and you wake up and here's this massive storm, and you're watching your books blow out into Lake Michigan. And when these storms blow in, it was sunny and beautiful before I fell asleep. 
And when I came to, I mean, it was just like utter chaos. That storm came in just that quick, and it rolled in, and it was bad. And you looked out there, because where I lived is right by Bell Harbor, Belmont Harbor. And there was all these sailboats and everything that were out there, and they were flipping over and, and capsizing out there, because when this storm hits, it hits. And so they, they were in a really bad situation. So that's kind of the storm that N.T. Wright is talking about here that gathered off the Atlantic coast, sometimes that are called the perfect storm, where everything just comes together and collides. Well, it was late October 1991, and the crew of the fishing boat, the Andrea Gale, set out of Gloucester, Massachusetts. And it had taken the vessel out about 500 miles into the Atlantic Ocean at the time. And this cold front moving along the Canadian border sent a strong disturbance then down through New England, while at the same time, this large high pressure system was building over the maritime province in southeastern Canada. This intensified the low pressure, producing what locals called the Halloween Nor'easter. And as we think about that, I'm sure if you've been around as long as I have, and you know, some of us are kind of old as dirt, we remember the Andrea Gale, or we remember that being on the news. So Robert Case, who's a meteorologist, put it this way, these circumstances alone could have created a strong storm, but then throwing gasoline, like throwing gasoline on the fire, the dying Hurricane Grace then delivered an immeasurable amount of tropical energy, that warm front that I was talking to you about. And it created the perfect storm. The hurricane sweeping in from the Atlantic then completed that picture of all of this turbulence. The forces of nature converged on the helpless Andrea Gale from the west, the north, and the southeast. Ferocious winds, huge waves reduced the boat to nothing more than matchwood. Only light debris was ever found. There had, of course, been earlier perfect storms, but this one was made famous by the book and movie of the same title of the Andrea Gale. So right here then compares that singular storm to the forces that met in the, the last days of Jesus' life. He goes on and talks about all of the things that came together when Jesus came into Jerusalem. He was facing then that perfect storm. We talked about that. Terry talked about some of the things last week, and I talked about the Pharisees and the Sadducees and everything that they were plotting as he went through his journey. And we're going to see more of that this Wednesday, so be prepared. Um, but the ingredients of that approaching storm were an oppressive Roman Empire which governed the land, the legalistic religious authorities, the, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, who dominated and controlled the lives of all of the common people, of all the Jews in the, in the area in there, and what Wright calls the wind of God, the long-awaited and much un- misunderstood fulfillment of God's plan for his people. They were looking for this Messiah. They were looking for someone, unfortunately, they were looking at it all wrong. They were looking for someone who was going to come in and save them and, and free them from the Roman oppressors that had come in and, and taken over their land and were really, truly decimating their lives as a Jewish people. So here it is, all these forces are coming together like that nor'easter, that perfect storm. And so God was trying to fulfill his plans for his people and for the world through Jesus. But see, that storm had to happen. In order for us to have salvation, that perfect storm had to come to play. So we need to understand that. That perfect storm came to the head of the Passover feast as it approached in about 30 AD in Jerusalem. And we're going to see a video segment at the end of the message here today before our music starts about that uh, Passover feast and that time when Jesus entered the city. So as we focus on that perfect storm in which Jesus rose, rode into on that Palm Sunday, that first Palm Sunday, there were three interests that arrayed against Jesus who corresponded to that great salvation that he had when we talk about that in Hebrews 2, 3. 
And that's available to everyone by grace through faith in Christ. And see, that threatened both the Romans and the Jewish leadership at the time. That threatened both of them. And it's one of those few things that is described in all four Gospels in the Bible. So if you want to follow along with me, if you open up your Bibles to page 782, I looked it up for you to make it nice and easy. We're going to read from Luke chapter 19, and then verses 28 through 40 and 45 through 48. After this, after Jesus had said this, he went on ahead going up to Jerusalem. And as he approached Bethphage and Bethany, the hill called the Mount of Olives, he sent two of his disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you, and as you enter it, you will find a colt tied there, which no one has ever ridden. Untie it and bring it here. If anyone asks you, why are you untying it? Say, the Lord needs it. Those who were sent ahead went and found it just as he had told them. And as they were untying the colt, its owners asked him, why are you untying the colt? And they replied, the Lord needs it. Then they brought it to Jesus, and they threw their cloaks on the colt and put Jesus on that colt. And as he went along, the people spread their cloaks on the road, and when he came near the place where the road goes down into the Mount of Olives, the whole crowd of disciples began joyfully to praise God in loud voices for all of the miracles that they had seen, all of the things that they had come to witness. Blessed is the King who comes in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to Jesus, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. I tell you, he replied, if they keep quiet, the stones themselves will cry out. When Jesus entered the temple courts, he began to drive out those who were selling, and it is written, he said to them, My house will be a house of prayer, but you have made it into a den of robbers. Every day he was teaching in the temple. But the chief priests and the teachers of the law and the leaders among the people were actually plotting to try to kill him. Yet they could not find any way to do it because all the people hung on his words. He was forming a relationship with those people to bring them through the storms that were about to unfold. And so we know in the next seven days, there was a lot that happened in Jerusalem. There was a lot that happened with the people there. See, that event was called the Triumphal Entry. And as he entered in, and it had been celebrated by churches around the world on Palm Sunday for the past 2,000 years. But see, there was far more going on that day than, than may have been first obvious. His entry into the city of Jerusalem at the beginning of that fateful week can even supply an illustration of three things that change when Jesus then enters into our lives as well. The first one is salvation comes to the human heart, not as a result of religion and self-effort, like that of the Pharisees and Sadducees, but as a result of relationship as a result of the presence, the living presence of Jesus coming into your heart and taking up residence there as Savior and Lord. So this was what I was talking about in the beginning of my message today. A, and a true living relationship with Jesus brings about things that no amount of religion could ever do. No amount of religion can ever replace a living relationship with Jesus. See, it isn't about the rites and the rituals. It isn't about how fancy the church looks. It isn't about man-made constructs that we, that we all have to face at all. It's about the living God present in a relationship that comes from your heart. Not a building from your heart, from inside you. That relationship comes from your heart, your holy holies. That is the center of your emotions for your entire body, for your entire being, the dwelling place of your soul. And there's lots of scriptures that we've read about what? What comes out of the heart? Right? Oh, man. 
<laughs> so out of the heart comes your character, how you relate to God, how do you relate to other people. So let's look at those three things happen when we invite Jesus in. Number one, when Jesus enters my life, forgiveness comes to me because he is then my high priest. We don't have to have someone intercede on our behalf because Jesus is then our high priest. We don't have to confess to somebody else. We don't have to go to a, a priest and, and give them our worries. We go directly to Jesus because we have a one-on-one -on -one personal and living relationship with Jesus. So one of the elements in that perfect storm that I was talking about eventually swept Jesus up to Calvary, and that was the Sadducees. So we had those elements that way. We had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Romans, and it was all coming together. So the Sadducees, the Sadducees, you know, they, oh, I knew that joke. Right? Yeah, they're Sadducee because they didn't know who Jesus was. But that's a bad joke. <laughs> That's a dad joke left over from HB. The Sadducees were the priestly party of Jesus' day. They were the elite caretakers of the temple. They were the ones who did all the prescribes and the constructs of the temple and what went on within the temple. So the Sadducees and the scribes of the day worked very closely to then present to the people God's wills and wishes they then sent to the Pharisees the laws, the 630 laws, commandments that were written in the Bible that they had to live out each and every day. Tough thing to do. Tough thing to do. The high priest was a Sadducee. The high priest represented the people before God, interceding with God on behalf of the people. And it was the high priest's job to offer sacrifices that brought about forgiveness and cleansing for God's people. It was a form, and it was a force that dated back to Aaron, the brother of Moses, because he was the one, you see, that put most of these things in place. So when you talk about the law of Moses, Aaron was actually the one who carried those laws forth and gave them to the people. So then we see Jesus, when he entered Jerusalem, he made his way to the temple and cleansed the temple courts. He was stepping on some Sadducees' toes in doing that because they were the ones who were in charge of the temple and what went on there. But what was going on there? Remember what we read in the, in the call to worship today? What was going on? Well, it was a marketplace. They were selling. It was a den of robbers and thieves because the people would bring their sacrifices to the priests. They would have to say, okay, this is, this is going to be good enough to be used as a sacrifice. Well, this one has a blemish. You need to go over here to Joe, and Joe's going to sell you a new dove, or a new ram, or something for a perfect sacrifice. And of course, you know, it may have been that that was a good enough sacrifice to start with, but they made a lot of money off the people doing those kind of things. So it was a den of robbers and thieves. And so Jesus coming in to cleanse that temple threatened the Sadducees. He was a threat to the power and to the place of that priestly party. But he was and is more important because the Bible says that Jesus is himself both the high priest and the one and all sacrifice for all sin. The law is only the shadow of of the good things that are coming, not the realities in it themselves. For this reason, it can never, and by the same sacrifice repeated endlessly year after year after year, make perfect then those people who draw in to worship. Otherwise, they would have not stopped being offered. For the worshipers, there would have been, they would have been cleansed once and for all, and there would no longer they would no longer have to feel guilty for their sins. But those sacrifices were an annual reminder of sins. 
and it is impossible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings, you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will, my God. Hebrews 10, 1 through 10. First he says, sacrifices and offerings, burnt offerings and sin offerings, you did not desire, nor were you pleased with them. And this is what, for thousands of years, the Jewish people were presenting based upon the laws of Moses. And though they were offered in accordance with the law, he said, here I am. I have come to do your will. He sets aside the first, those first sets of laws to offer up then a second offering. And by that will we have been made holy through the sacrifice of and the body of Jesus once and for all. Jesus came a high priest above all high priests and did not offer a bull or a lamb as a sacrifice. He offered himself as a living sacrifice. And so when Jesus comes into our lives today, he takes up residence in our hearts, in our Holy of Holies. Then when we begin a day-by-day -day moment, a moment-by-moment -moment relationship with him, his saving and healing presence brings forgiveness and cleansing that no religious act could ever bring about. It's not how many beads we pray on. That won't save us. That won't bring us cleansing. That won't bring us salvation. It's not about the rites and the rituals. It's not about confessing to a priest for absolution because a priest cannot do that. He cannot give you absolution for your sins. Only Jesus can give you absolution for your sins. Only God can do that. It's not about some memorized prayers. It's not about having no one and nothing between you it is a living relationship with Jesus. And that's all you need. You don't need all the rest of the stuff. It's just stuff. It's constructs of man, not of God. God says, I have sent you my son as a living sacrifice. And whoever believes upon him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. He gave God to us. He gave Jesus to us. God in his flesh. So I don't have to take a precious offering to a priest to have my sins forgiven. I can have the high priest actually living in my heart. And when I have him living within me, I have that complete cleansing, that complete forgiveness through his once and all sacrifice for me. We have to have that relationship in order to understand that relationship. There's another way which is true, a living relationship with Jesus brings about far more than what religion could ever do. And that's number two. When Jesus enters my life, righteousness comes to me because he is the fulfillment of the laws. Those 630 laws were fulfilled in Christ coming to us. We're not subjugated to the laws. If we look at Luke 19 again, two parties objected to Jesus' actions on that first Palm Sunday. The first one was the Sadducees, as verse 47 calls them, the chief priests and the scribes. The other mentioned in verse 39 is the Pharisees, and we've talked about Pharisees many, many, many times. Jesus had a great term for them, vipers, you den of vipers. What is a viper? Everybody know what a viper is? A very poisonous thing. Who's he referring to? Yep, that's right. So, the Pharisees were the teachers of the law. Remember we had 630 laws, but they had also added on to those laws, which are not written laws, they were subjugation laws for the people. They had over a thousand of them. So if you can imagine trying to be a person who was trying to do their best, 
how hard is it for us to do the Ten Commandments, let alone another 620 up on that, and then another 1,000 up on top of that? It's really tough to do. And so the people, I mean, if you can imagine living under that kind of pressure and that kind of stress to try and fulfill that and to try and keep yourself underneath the law without being punished for being outside the law. These things were very tough to do. So the Pharisees were the teachers of the law. The rabbis were the others who relied on the adherence to the law of Moses in every detail to try and gain favor in God's sight. And as I said a few weeks ago, they thought they were trying to do the will of God, but instead they were going against the will of God and leading the people astray. So they identified 613 separate commandments that God had given to his people and insisted on strict obedience to every one of them. More than that, they added traditions that were intended to keep the people from ever getting close to breaking one of those 613 commandments. Kind of one of those better safe than sorry moments, you might say. But of course, from the giving of the law through Moses to the time of Jesus, not one human being had succeeded in keeping the law. Not even the Pharisees, not the Sadducees, none of them could keep the law. In fact, one accomplished Pharisee later wrote, Jews and Gentiles alike are under the power of sin, as it is written. There is no one righteous, not even one. There is no one who does good, not even one. Romans 3, 9. Despite the Pharisees' efforts, no one, not one soul, had managed to keep the law of God. Because, see, here's the thing. The law was not given to make us righteous. The law was not given to make us righteous. The Bible says the law was given to show us our sin instead. Romans 3.20 says, No one will be declared righteous in God's sight by the works of the law. Rather, through the law, we become conscious of our sins. So we know what we are doing wrong. We have that consciousness within inside us. When we have Christ living within us, then he can cleanse us of those sins. We have forgiveness through him and his sacrifice for us. In other words, the law exists so that you and I and all of us will know that we are sinners. Why? so that we know that we need a savior. And that's where Jesus comes in. Jesus is not an extension of the law. He's the fulfillment of the law. He came to fulfill the law. So we didn't have to. He said, do not think that I have come to abolish the law of the prophets. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them in Matthew 5:17. Jesus is the fulfillment of the law, so when he enters my life, or more accurately, when I by faith enter into a relationship with him, then the fulfillment of the law takes up residence within me. When he enters my life, righteousness enters in with him because he is righteousness. That right relationship with God. That goes back to the triune God. When I'm in relationship with Jesus, I'm in relationship with God. I'm in relationship to the Holy Spirit. I have now been fulfilled through Christ. The scripture tells us God made him who had no sin to be sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.2 so when I have Christ living in me, I have the righteousness living in me, and I have that righteousness then as we represent Christ to others, as we are Christ's representatives, then we have that righteousness flowing out from us to others. Righteousness, by definition, is a right relationship with God. And if we can present that right relationship with God to others, then they will see that representation of Christ. You might be the only representation of Christ they ever see. So we have to put on our best backwards.
Romans 5, verse 17, <coughs> the Apostle Paul says, Those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, and that is through Jesus Christ. When Jesus enters my life, forgiveness comes to me because of the sacrifice he made for me as high priest. When Jesus enters my life, righteousness comes along too because he was the fulfillment of the law. And yet there's one more way yet that is true. A living relationship with Jesus brings about far more than what religion ever could. The point number three, when Jesus enters my life, a new power comes to me because he is my king. And if we think back to our Easter reading, the story of uh, how a few days uh, after entering the city, Jesus was then arrested and then placed on trial and shuttled between King Herod, the self-styled king of the Jews, and Pilate, the governor and the representative of the Roman emperor, then these earthly rulers supposedly had the power to pardon or sentence Jesus. Yet the whole time Jesus stood before these human rulers, true power was in his hands and not theirs. But they didn't know that. Are you the king of the Jews, asked Pilate. Jesus answered, you have said so, he replied. See, Jesus wasn't going to lie. He couldn't deny his kingship. They could arrest him, but he was still king. They could imprison him, but he was still king. They could flog him and beat him and nail him to a cross, but he was still king. And so he is. Yet today, he is king. The issue here is that Jesus had said his kingdom is not of this earth. And they were only thinking of terms that they could understand and that it was of an earthly king. This is why after Jesus had died and rose from the dead, his closest followers asked him, Lord, are you now going to restore the kingdom to Israel? They're still thinking about him wiping out the Romans. And getting rid of them. They still didn't understand. They lived and ate with him and walked with him each and every day and they still didn't understand. Are you going to take your throne and exert all your power and of course then share it with us? They still didn't fully understand that Jesus is a different kind of king. And his kingdom was a different kind of kingdom. But he knew what he, they were asking, so he answered, you will receive power. But it won't be political power. There won't be temporal power. He told them that theirs would be a power of a different kind, but no less real. Power to testify to Jesus' kingship, as they had done so powerfully on that uh, day of Pentecost. Power to heal, as Peter and John demonstrated in the healing of the beggar in the temple. Power to turn weakness into strength as Paul experienced after his conversion. Power to resist temptation. Power to conquer evil. Power to withstand persecution. Power to change the world as the whole book of Acts reveals. And see, the great thing about this is, is that power is ours too. If you accept the king, because when Jesus enters your life, a new power comes to you because he is your king. All the power of the kingdom comes when the king enters in. All of the power of the king comes when the king enters in. That's what's meant by Jesus when he told his followers, anyone who has faith in me will do what I have been doing, and he will do even greater things than these. If we remember back to John 14. And those are very bold words, but true for us today. Yet today. Because, why? Because the king has entered in. The king resides within us. He lives within us. And see, one of the problems is, these can be lost on us today because we can't visualize ourselves having these kind of powers. But we do. Through faith, through prayer, we have those powers. 
So I want you to think back on all of the answered prayers that we've had here at Grace Street Church in the last seven years. How did we do that? Did we do it on our own understanding? Did we do it of our own accord? Not whatsoever. We did it because we prayed to God to do a mighty act in someone's life. And he answered the prayer. We have that power. We ask God to do his will in that person's life. See, that power can be yours too if it isn't already. And all of this can be true for you by means of a simple prayer that I invite you to pray along with me right now. And it'll be on the screen. Lord Jesus, I've tried and failed to do good things and to live a righteous life by my own efforts. I don't deserve your forgiveness. I can't achieve righteousness. I have no power in myself to live the kind of life I want. The kind of life you call me to. I know that religious efforts will never get me where I want to go. So instead I call on you. I confess my sin and I turn to you. And I claim your sacrifice on the cross as payment for all of the wrong things I've done. I ask you to come into my heart, take residence there, and exert control there. That I may know the forgiveness, the righteousness, and the power that can only come through a relationship with you. Amen. Now if you prayed that prayer, the Bible says you've begun living a real relationship with the risen Christ. Pastor Terry and I would love to talk to you more about how to grow in that relationship and to keep it vibrant day by day. And for all of us, join with me in this prayer as we pray together. Lord God, thank you for the forgiveness, the righteousness, and the power that is ours through Christ Jesus. We confess that we often try to live our daily lives on our own strength instead of relying on Jesus' presence in our hearts. Please help us to rely on your grace, not our own efforts, and to keep our relationship fresh and vibrant and strong through trusting prayer with childlike faith. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Yeah. It's the thunder. <laughs> Thank you. I heard God speak. <laughs> Oftentimes, churches out of religion will come together to break bread and drink of it. But if you've heard us at all over the last several years, it's not. It's exactly what Mark was talking about today. It's a relationship. It's why he had a meal with his disciples. You don't go and just have a meal with strangers. He had an intimate gathering with his disciples and that night that he was about to be betrayed. And even Judas was there. He took the bread and he broke it, saying, This is my body broken for you. Take and eat. And then a little later in the meal, after singing some hymns, he took the cup and filled it. said, This is the cup of the new covenant. My sh blood shed for the sins of many. Take and drink. And it is because Scripture commands it but also because of the relationship we have with Jesus that we do this as often as we come together. The body of Christ broken for you, take and eat. The blood of Christ shed for you, take and drink. Heavenly Father, is me. partake of this meal that is representative of what your son did for us on the cross. We thank you. 
remind us whether it's through reading your scriptures, spending time with other Christians, or just hearing that still small voice, that we are in relationship with you. And that even in the smallest of our storms, we should be giving thanks. In the midst of our big storms, we should be giving thanks. Let us look for you in and through everything, in Jesus' name, amen. amen. And good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Time for prayers for the people. <laughs> so is anybody? Yes, Dennis. I have a prayer request and a <laughs> praise report. Okay. A young lady, Pamela. That was my first coach at Twisters who worked for me for free mm -hmm. for like six years. Mm -hmm. Lives in British Columbia, Canada now. Mm -hmm. And I was concerned about the fires. She said they're pr pretty safe right now, but they're packed up, ready to go if needed, <laughs> and they'll stay packed up till October. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Yes. Well, I was mm -hmm. going to pray for the fires. Praise, so. praise report is I've been without air conditioning for several months, oh. and I had applied to an agency which I can't think of the name. And I got a letter the other day, they're sending spec sheets out for quotes to uh, not only re replace the air conditioning, replace the st front storm door and every window in the house. Oh my gosh, wow. well, praise so, God. Yes. What a blessing, I'm so excited awesome. for you. That's wonderful. I'm excited too. How soon is that coming? <laughs> is that coming this month or? It'll be a while. They said they'll allow two weeks for the bids to come in oh, wow. before they pick contractors. Or whatever. Sure, sure. So. Mm. Oh, wow. Okay. <laughs> All right. Is there anybody else? Okay. So, Father God, we come into your house this morning to give you praise. <laughs> and thank you for all the blessings you bestow on us each and every day. Thank you for this church, Father God where we can come and worship you every Sunday and every Wednesday. And we just thank you that uh, Pastor Mark and Terry are here for us. There's not a day that goes by that you are not with us. You walk with us through the storms of this life. You give us wisdom to navigate in this dark world. You give us mercies new each day. You give us hope that each new tomorrow will be better than today. Your unfailing love and forgiveness no one can fathom. Therefore, Lord, as it states in Psalms 51, 10, and 12, create in me a pure heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me from your presence or take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation and grant me a willing spirit to sustain me. Help us as Christian people, holy and dearly loved, to cast out the fears of this world and to walk in your ways of everlasting, that we might be a witness for you to show others your wonders and great love that you have for all mankind. And Father God, as you walk with Doug and his ministry to others, give him courage and boldness to declare your words to those that will hear and help them to apply those words of wisdom to their lives. Please walk with Doug all the days of his life and may you be his guiding light Please heal his body to enable him to spread your word to all in need. And thank you, Father God, for Doug and all he is doing. Father God, we lift up Mary to you today. Please give her doctors wisdom to help her body. Please give her relief from her pain, comfort and guide her through her trials. And Father God, uh, be with Alan Tickey's family for he has lost his mother, Bonnie. She's been a friend of our families for a long time. And we just ask for comfort for his family and guide them in your perfect love, Lord Jesus. Let you surround them and give them peace in their hearts. In Jesus' name, I pray for them. We thank you for uh, Denny's blessing this morning. We praise and honor you for Denny. And we just um, thank you for all that things are happening in his life. And we pray that relief will come quickly. And Father God, I lift up Lynette's father and mother 
Uh, her father's having issues of falling and her mother is by his side. I thank you, Lord, for, his, for this family, and I ask a hedge of protection surround them as they meet each new day. Comfort them, Father God, during these trying times, and give the family discernment to know how to help their mom and dad. And Father God, I lift up all those who are suffering from anxiety, fear, depression, illness, or cancer. We ask that your hand be upon them, that you send your angels to sur surround them, Protect them and guide them to you. Guide them to doctors if they need to get help for them on their journey to restore health. Help them to know that through prayer and petition, you will walk with them through to the other side of renewed life. For you will not leave one person who calls on your name with a humble heart to fend for themselves. You will be in the midst of their struggle, guiding them through it all. There are so many things you do for us that we do not see or fathom. Therefore, we give all the glory, honor, and praise for our healings, Lord Jesus. Father God, there are severe wild, wildfires out of control in California, Canada, and Montana, and other states in America. You are in control of the winds and the rain, and we praise you for who you are. We ask that you send the rain to drown out the fires and preserve your beautiful land once again. We give you all the glory and praise in Jesus' name. And Father God, the war in Israel has taken a turn against the innocent once again. Father, as always, you are in control. I'm asking you to stop this senseless war, to forgive and protect your people once again. Comfort these families that have lost children and loved ones as only you can. Let your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. And Father God, as always, we ask that our children and grandchildren find you so that they can walk humbly with you and know who you are and have a walk with them through their life. I thank you, Father, that you take care of our homeless and guide them through their lives. Help us to do what you have asked us to do in Micah 6, 8. He has showed you, O oh man, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you? To, jet, to act justly and to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. In Jesus' holy name, amen. Amen. Oh. And let me just destroy your whole plan. <laughs> <laughs> oh. And it's all good. It's kind of been my morning. There you go. <laughs> Not a problem. Well, thank you, Denise. You know, it's, it's kind of fun to watch God work in the midst of our situations and uh, to watch God work uh, as you're giving the prayers uh, because your prayers today fit exactly with the message. Yeah, it did. And I wrote this two weeks ago. Yeah. <laughs> so the hand of God is, is active and living and with yeah. us. It's that relationship mm -hmm. with the living God. Mm -hmm. He knows far ahead of time what you're going to say and what I'm going to say. Mm -hmm. And yet he brings it all together so that the ears that need to hear will hear his word. Amen. We just need to act upon it now. <laughs> So this uh, brings us to the close of our online portion of our service today, and I thank you for joining us. And uh, as always, we always ask you to come in here um, and join us in person. We'd love to see you and uh, be a fellowship member in the body of Christ. Uh, so let's go to God in prayer today and ask for his blessings upon us. Dear Lord Jesus, every good and perfect gift is a blessing from you. And you have blessed us with so much. We ask that you would use us to be a blessing to others who are in need or facing these storms of life, these difficulties that they face. We ask, Lord, that you would make us a channel of your blessing, a channel through which whom your love, your peace, and your joy would flow through, out from us to others, that we might represent you to others. May we be your hands and feet to bless others. May we guide others our feet to places where we can go to be that blessing. May our speech be so that we may speak words of comfort and encouragement and speak truth in love. 
give us the grace. Enable us and embolden us to be available when others are in need. Lord, we pray that you would increase in our lives and that we might decrease ourselves before others so that the blessings that you pour from us to others may draw each one of them closer to you, closer to in your arms, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Father, that your grace is sufficient for all of your children including those who are facing persecutions and dangers in so many parts of this torn world. Thank you, Lord, that you are here in the midst of the storms of the political movements in our country. We ask that your ultimate will would be done, not by those works of men, but by works of your spirit, by works of your children, your family. But Lord, we are all brothers and sisters in Christ, and we are all one in you. And that pain that an individual believer suffers becomes communal stress for all of those in the body of Christ. And so, oh Lord, we lift up today all of those who have to contend with so many dangers and difficulties in the world. We ask that you would comfort and strengthen each person who is suffering. Draw each one of those close to you so that your strength in that strength, we might persevere in these troublesome times. And in doing so, bring glory and honor to you. Let us serve as your faithful witness to those who are lost in their sins. Help us to show forth your grace and goodness as a beacon to others. We ask, Lord, that you would comfort and surround each hurting heart. Bless who are all those who are in need of healing bring relief to those who are in need and keep each one of us firm in the faith that we have in you Christ Jesus our Lord thank you Lord that there is not one of your children who has lost your eyes and we lift each and every one of them up to you today in Jesus precious and holy name we pray Amen. Amen. <clears throat>